in our mind's eye. Two gardens, two trees. What if we could look over there and see a man stumbling into a garden? To the center of the garden. He's fallen on his knees and he's clutching the ground as if to hold on. He looks so weak. He's crying and he's sweating and he's bleeding from his sweat and he's saying, Abba, Father, you can do anything. I know you can do anything. He's anguished and distressed and he cries out, my soul is crushed with grief, but still, not my will, but your will be done. And being in agony, he prays even more earnestly. And he says, Oh, Father, I want your will and not mine to be done. And then an angel appears to him from heaven and strengthens him as he smells the fruit stretched out in the hand of his companion, Eve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, to the throne that we come today to ask for the forgiveness that only you can give, that was purchased by the life, death, burial, and resurrection of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, our Messiah, the Christ. Please send your Holy Spirit to fill us and enlighten us as we study your holy word today. Be alive in our minds and our hearts, and teach us what you would have us learn this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. My question is, what if Adam had prayed in his garden like Jesus prayed in his? Romans 5, 17, we just heard, and this one is from the New American Standard Bot version, and it says, For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression, that would be the failure of Adam, there resulted condemnation to all men, that would be us. Even so, through one act of righteousness, that would be Jesus, there resulted justification of life to all men, that would be us. Amen. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made, what? Right. Righteous. Understand what this means to us? Uh, what a wonderful gift we've been given. Amen. Now here's a question I'd like to ask you regarding the condition of Adam and Eve. Were Adam and Eve aware of danger before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. I'm going to briefly read from the Spirit of Prophecy and you can find this on the screen as we talk about it. It says, our first parents, though created innocent and holy we're not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing god made them free moral agents capable of appreciating the wisdom and benevolence of his character and the justice of his requirements and with full liberty to yield or to withhold obe obedience please note god did not create robots they were at full liberty to yield or to withhold obedience and what did they actually have to offer to God anyway? Didn't he create everything all around them? I mean, what one thing that they had control over did they even have that they could offer to God? Their loving compliance to his instructions. That's all they had. So they were to enjoy a communion with God and with holy angels. But before they could be rendered eternally secure and, I should say, safe for heaven, their loyalty must be tested. At the very beginning of man's existence, a check was placed upon the desire for self-indulgence, and that was the fatal passion that lay at the foundation of Satan's tree, of Satan's fall. One place that they could prove their loyalty after the great rebellion that had taken place in heaven was at the tree. At the tree, they could prove their loyalty. 
Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, chapter, or let's see, page 48 and paragraph 4 says, the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge, which stood near the tree of life in the midst of the garden, was to be a test of the obedience, faith, and love of our parents. While permitted to eat freely of every other tree, they were forbidden to taste of this on pain of death. Now here's another part that's so beautiful. While permitted to eat freely of every other tree, they were forbidden to taste of this on pain of death. They were also to be exposed to the temptations of Satan, but if they endured the trial, they would finally be placed beyond his power to enjoy perpetual favor with God. If Adam and Eve had endured the trial, history would be completely different, wouldn't it? And that's why I use that little imagination, spiritual sanctification, imagination scene at the beginning. What if Adam had prayed like Jesus prayed? What if Adam had prayed in his garden like Jesus prayed in his? Were Adam and Eve aware of danger before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I almost wanted to say were they aware of evil but evil implied that they would have already had a fallen nature. But this warning, our first parents were not left without a warning of the danger that threatened them. <laughs> Heavenly messengers opened to them the history of Satan's fall and his plots for their destruction, unfolding more fully the nature of the divine government. You know, when I was thinking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I was thinking that maybe Adam and Eve were so innocent that they couldn't even conceive of a deceiver. But they were warned of a danger, so they must have understood the possibility of some kind of trouble coming to them. So they did have an understanding. They did have a warning. And this was like uh, unfolding more fully the nature of the divine government, which the prince of evil was trying to overthrow. It was by disobedience to the just commands of God that Satan and his host had fallen. How important then that Adam and Eve should honor that law by which alone it was possible for order and equity to be maintained. You know, Satan was plotting the ruin of the human race. He was no longer free to stir up rebellion in heaven, so Satan's enmity against God found a new field in plotting the ruin of the human race. In the happiness and peace of the holy parent Eden, he beheld a vision of a bliss or a happiness that to him was lost forever. Have you ever noticed how people try to take other people down? This was part of his ploy. Now, in these two pictures, it seems as if, as if Satan had come in the form of a fallen angel because they'd been warned. Eve might have been a bit more cautious. But, you know, because the flying winged serpent was so flattering, he flattered her, told her how lovely and beautiful she was. And he was interesting to look at. She was not on her guard. And she was ready to give up the one thing that she had that she could ever offer to a loving God. And what was that? Her will to be loyal and believe that his words were true. That's all she had to offer. But Satan deceived her. And as a result, you know that she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree of life illustration shows all the fruits of the spirit, unity, happiness, no other gods. Remember the Sabbath. It also has branches that have all the law of the government of God in it. Do not. No graven images. Don't take God's name in, in vain. Honor your parents. Faith, gentleness, joy, love, peace, meekness, goodness, temperance, and long-suffering. But on the other side, we have human reasoning, envy, jealousy, disharmony, vanity, competition, strife, even fornication. So, when you think about this, he wanted to change their love to distrust. He would change their love to distrust and their songs of praise to reproaches against their maker. Thus, he would not only plunge these innocent beings into the same misery which he himself was enduring, but he would cast dishonor upon God and cause grief in heaven. 
Grief in heaven, dishonor upon God. He wanted to change their love to distrust and reproaches. You know, when we have a human child who goes out and does something that is not bringing honor to that parent, it casts reproach upon that parent. And we wonder, what could we have done differently? And so even God was, was being forced to face this grief that his wonderfully created children had decided against him. So let's view the scene in another garden on the Mount of Olives. And, uh, you know, olive trees are some of the oldest trees that we have on the earth. They live, they can live so very long and they get so very big. And these are from a scene of uh, Gethsemane. And Aramaic Gethsemane means olive press. And, of course, it was the garden that's spoken of in the New Testament as being near the Mount of Olives. And you think about this, um, the... Uh, the press would have been huge, it would have been made of stone, it would have had a huge stone there that would have been used to press out the olives. And they might have used a donkey to move that huge stone round and round on those gentle little olives. And eventually, what would they have? The ripe olives would come under weight and pressure, and they'd release the oil of the olive, and they would be, it would be used for lamps and light. So where Jesus would have gone in this other garden, there very well may have been an olive press there, a stone olive press in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you wanted to think about how difficult it was going to be for Jesus, how appropriate it is that he would be pressed, there would be weight upon him, and whatever was squeezed out of him would be that which was his true nature. And we're about to look at some of that. Well, there was a garden, John 18, 1 through 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, and where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because why? Jesus often met there with his disciples. What an odd place it looks today. We don't think about that as being like a garden, we would think there had to be plants, but it was a place where I'm sure the trees would kind of keep the dew off a little bit. Matthew 26, 36 through 44, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Well, he went a little farther, and he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. I want to point out that even in the midst of this terrible suffering, Jesus had something foremost in his mind. Even in sensing his separation from his, from his father, which he had never sensed before, the thought is there. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. The omnipotent God who can do all things is still in the forefront of his mind. And this is the faith of Jesus. I'm just thinking about that. This is the faith of the three Hebrew children who are getting ready to go into the fiery furnace. This is the faith of Daniel who was going to go into the lion's den. This is the faith of David who came out with a sling against the giant and five stones. And this is the faith of, of uh, Stephen who says, Father, forgive them. And this is the faith of Jesus. He's offering to God what Adam failed to offer to God. The will of a human about to suffer at the hands of demon-possessed people, about to suffer some of the worst cruelty, it's beyond description, and Jesus, the precious Son of God, the Son of Man, declares, not my will, but thine be done. This, brothers and sisters, is the faith of Jesus. Not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And as we think about that, 
Then he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter in temptation, into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So again he prayed a second time, he went away, and he said, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. I guess the, the, the most amazing part about this is that our Heavenly Father sent a son into the world, conceived by the Virgin Mary, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and was as much the seed of the woman as you and I are the seed of the woman. We are the seed. We are human. And he came and suffered this in flesh like we have. But he prayed. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, this is in the book of Luke, which is not in the other Gospels, that an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than the sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. In that little imaginary scene we had, do you suppose God would have withheld an angel from Adam if he had prayed in the garden like Jesus prayed in his garden? So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow, and he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. I don't have to share with you that this is an example to us that we are supposed to pray, we're supposed to stay awake in these days, and lest we would enter into some kind of temptation. But what if they had prayed in their garden like Jesus prayed in his? That's a big question. And it could have had a different answer. We are, we're told that if they had prayed at that time, they would have had uh, a strength to go through the trials that were coming to them. And God had told them to pray. Jesus tells them to pray. Watch and pray with me. Uh, with the instructions that can't be taken lightly. Well, we're also going to talk about two trees. We've had two gardens, now we're going to talk about two trees. You know, this one, Jesus chose death on a tree so that we could live and eat from the tree of life. Because the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Christ became a curse for us in our place. In the New King James Version of John chapter 5, verse 30, which was quoted so much this morning in our Sabbath school lesson, Jesus says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. The will of the Father who sent me. And in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. That's from John 16, verse 26. Because you have loved me. You know, I was thinking about that, and I'm, the Father himself loves you. He said, because you have loved me, you have loved Jesus. And you believe. So how do we show him our love? What do we have that, that we can give to him that he has not given us? All things come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. We, we used to sing that as a, re, uh, a, a response to our offerings. And when you think about that, what demonstration of our love could he possibly want? Does he want endless repetition of prayers over and over? Uh, does he want construction of little images that we could bow down to? Does he want us to suffer by beating our backs with some kind of whips or something? Does he want Facebook posts and or Instagram quips? What was Adam asked to show to the living God that he, Adam, loved God? And what did Adam have to give to God? 
And by this time you have to know what he was. It was, what did Adam have to give? His loving obedience, his will. His will. The Bible says in John 14, 15, you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And isn't that a promise? His will. Love will involve your will. The get up and go inside your soul that tells you what to do. Your will. And this is God in us, the hope of glory. He's working out his character in your life, my life, through love. Love of his goodness, love of his wisdom, his righteousness, his gift of his son to us, his forgiveness of our sins. It's through love. Notice that it's a promise. You will keep my commandments. So the question really is, do you, do I love him? In John 14, 21, it says, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who Finish it for me. Those who love me. John 14, 21. It's not sloppy agape. It's not cheap grace. It's in him and through him. And you know, those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. His commandments, written on stone with his own fingers. His own finger. John 16, 20, and this one is 30, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Please note this verse. Where is our peace? Our peace is in Him. We must live our lives surrendered to Christ so that we are in Him. He's done all the work. He's the one who went to the cross. He's the one who suffered and died. He's the one who lived the pure, pure, sinless life. We have to believe what he has done, and we have to receive this eternal life for ourselves starting today. We can abide in Christ. We can abide in his words. And in him, we may have peace. Do you want peace today? Amen. Amen. We want peace today. So in the world, we're going to have tribulation. But what else does he say? Take courage. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In John 5.30, I want you to notice this translation in the New American Standard Bible. We read it before in the uh, New King James, but it said, I can do nothing of myself. This one actually interprets it slightly different, which I, I appreciate. It says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. He didn't start his own plans. He he did nothing on his own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Have you ever done an errand for someone and had the ease of executing their, their, uh, that errand by saying, well, the person who sent me here wants it this way. You know, you're off the hook. You're just the messenger. You're doing the will of another person. That might happen if Marty sends me to get something, and I've got a picture, and I'm at, I'm at uh, Home Depot, and I say, well, this is what he wants. And it's not like I want it, it's like, this is what he wants, help me find it. You're doing the will of the person who sent you, and it's a lot easier. Like I said, you're off the hook, you're the messenger, you're doing the will of another person. Well, Jesus was doing the will of his father, the will of his father. And uh, we're supposed to be doing the will of our Father, right? Isn't that why we pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, in Philippians 4.13, and we have that actually hanging on the back wall as you go out. It says, I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? Who's doing the strengthening? Christ is strengthening who? Me. If he's strengthening you, I want you to raise your right hand and say, strengthening me. Strengthening, strengthening me. me. And I just want you to know, I can do this because he says I can. I can do this because he says I can. Now it's interesting because if you open up your bulletin, you're going to find this, this quote, part of it from this, in the steps to Christ. 
right in your bulletin on the back side. I'm quoting from the steps to Jesus, and there was no coordination except from heavenly Holy Spirit uh, thoughts. We all need to understand the value of willpower. The power of choice is the ruling power in life. Everything depends on the right use of this power. How much depends? Everything depends on the right use of this power. God has given the power of choice to each person, and it is theirs to use. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot give ourselves, give our love to God. Oh, that sounds very depressing, doesn't it? That we can't change our hearts, we can't give our love to God, and that's all we have to give is our love. But guess what? We can choose to serve Him. We can give Him the powers of our mind, and then He will help us choose the right way. Amen. Our whole being will be guided by the Spirit of Christ. We will love God, and our thoughts will be like His. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Would you say it with me? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 I can offer to the King of the universe my will and I can ask Him to keep it for me. I can do this because He says I can. Would you say that with me? I can do this because He says I can. Excellent. In Revelation 3, verse 10, from the New American Standard, I want you to look at the footnotes first. Here it says, steadfastness, and that's for perseverance. Here it says, temptation, and that's for testing. Here it says, inhabited earth, where it says the world, and here it says, Tempt, where it, there it says test. test. So, what do you think about that? Jesus is telling us in Revelation chapter 3, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. The hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Whose side are we on? The Armageddon war, war is being fought in our hearts. The God of the universe has a promise to us, and that promise is, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. Is that good news? Yes. Is that what you want? How many of us are living in the, in the last days and we, and we wonder, don't we wonder? We, we say to ourselves, God, will I, will I be on your team? Will I be on your side uh, when the test, hour of testing comes? And if we're on his side every day between now and then, we will be on his side. Amen? Amen. So he has promised to keep us from the hour of testing. And I love that. Let's say this one. He will do this because he says he can. Would you repeat that with me? He will do this because he says he can. Now, if he couldn't keep us from the hour of testing that's going to come on the earth, his word wouldn't be true, would it? But his word is true. Now, I want you to take that promise home with you. That hour, which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, is coming. In fact, it now is. If you are not inside Christ right now, being protected by His blessings and by His angels and by all the powers that God arranges to make your life work, you would be having tribulation. There are so many out there right now that are hungry physically, that are in wars and all kinds of terrible things that are going on besides our country. We've got our first world problems. But God has promised that the hour which is about to come upon the whole world is coming. So here's a question. What if we prayed in our gardens like Jesus prayed in His? This is our last verse and this is our last thought. It should humble us. 
It should make us have the fear of God, which is a reverence and respect. Jesus asked. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I'd like to invite